Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Homeroom live stream. Sal here from Khan Academy. Uh, we have a very exciting guest today, Margaret Spellings, former Secretary of Education of the United States and CEO of Texas 2036. Uh, but before we get to that, I will give my standard announcements. First of all, a reminder that Khan Academy is a not-for-profit organization. We can only exist through philanthropic donations. So if you're in a position to do so, please think about going to khanacademy.org slash donate. I also want to give a special shout out to several corporations that have stepped up uh, when they appreciated how many people were leaning on Khan Academy during the COVID crisis and continue to lean on Khan Academy and that we were already running at a deficit and our costs were going up. So special thanks to Bank of America, Google.org, AT&T, Fastly, and Novartis, and the many other supporters of Khan Academy. Uh, but we still have a gap, especially as we go into 2021. So as much help as you can provide is very much appreciated. Also want to remind everyone that you can get a version of uh, this live stream wherever you get your podcasts, Homeroom with Sal, the podcast. So with that, I'm excited to introduce Secretary Spellings. Hi, Sal. Margaret. Thanks for everything you do. No, well, thanks. Thanks for, for joining us. Uh, obviously, it's a it's a day where there's a lot of going on in the world, but it looks like the election results are kind of in a paused mode. So maybe maybe it is a good time for us to chat <laughs> about something else. Yeah, exactly about something else. So yeah. there's there's a ton to talk about, and I want to encourage everyone watching to uh, put any questions you have for Secretary Spellings or myself uh, on the message boards. We have team members who will surface them, and I'll try to get to as many as possible. But Margaret, you know, there's, I guess, two things I'd love to talk about. Well, first of all, tell, explain to all of us what Texas, uh, what Texas 2036 is. Well, 2036 is the bicentennial of Texas, our 200th birthday. And we use that kind of as a, as a hook to, to try to get people to think about the future. Uh, what we're trying to do is put what I call the sensible center together to think long term about the most important issues that confront our state. And of course, those are education and health, natural resources, infrastructure, the way our government performs, justice and safety issues. And we're trying to corral people to focus on the future, to think big, to think long term, and to use tons and tons of data, the facts, to inform our work. And is this, is this is like a, is this part of, is it kind of spawned by the government or is it a separate kind of industry, not for profit? It's an, it's a not for profit organization really created by the business community. It's a who's who of business and civic leaders from around our state who want us to get out of the tyranny of the urgent uh, and think long term about what our state will need. You know, we know Texas, like California and Nevada, the West, where we, where we uh, operate, uh, is big and growing and getting more diverse by the day. We're getting older, we're getting younger. We have a great hand to play with human capital as our number one asset, but we have to do a lot of things right to make sure that we fulfill uh, the, and leverage the, the possibility that we have with this vast number of talented people we have in our state. And what, you know, paint a picture for us, what, what, what does Texas 2036 look like uh, if, if y'all are successful? Well, we will have invested uh, in education and health. Uh, we sadly lead the nation in the number of uninsured uh, adults and children. We have the health outcomes to, to show for it. We are dead last on things like maternal mortality and diabetes and obesity and things like that when it comes to health indicators. Uh, where we were once in the mid thirties on our national education report card and reading we have fallen to the low 40s uh, on the NAEP and reading. And so we have work to do. And, uh, you know, it's going to take vigilance and attention by the business community. It's going to take resources, but it's going to take really all of us understanding that these are the priorities for our state and for our nation. And uh, we have to attend to them in the short term and over the long haul. Rome wasn't built in a day. Absolutely. And and putting your education hat on, which is really, you know, part of tw Education 2036, and obviously your experience as, as Secretary of Education, uh, you know, whoever is the next administration, obviously, we've had a, a beyond the healthcare crisis, the economic crisis, we've had an education crisis because of distance yeah. learning and COVID. Yeah. One could argue we already had an education crisis even before COVID. Yeah. If you were advising whoever is going to be Secretary of Education uh, come January, what would you encourage them to focus on and, and, and how to approach it? 
Well, one of the things I think is so critical, and you've just said it, Saul, is that, you know, our students have really lost ground. And, and in some cases, we've lost the kids. I mean, literally, our enrollment in Texas is down 6%. That's, mm. Those numbers hold up across the country. We have probably two to four million students who were enrolled last year and, and aren't this year, mostly in the early grades and pre-K programs and the like. For those students that are uh, enrolled and, and learning, uh, we know that it's not as productive as it once was, uh, obviously with an inability often to meet face to face and engage with teachers and peers. And so we really have to confront learning loss. We cannot afford to lose this generation of kids uh, and they are way behind uh, overall, especially our poor and minority students, those students for whom COVID has revealed really an incredible amount of inequity. And so what I would do if I were advising uh, the, the next president is to say, and, and you're tailor-made for this, Saul, you know, we've got to think about how are we going to get our students caught up and how are we going to use tutoring and one-on-one -on -one coaching and uh, other interventions, research-based practices to get those kids caught up. Secondly, I would say we have to have broadband, ubiquitous broadband and devices everywhere, period. And we need a national plan to do that. Obviously, states are important in those discussions. So those are two things I would do right away. And actually, I'll, I'll put the, uh, I'd lo also love you to advise us because, you know, your first point, actually, it touches on both points, but on that first point about ways do you, how do you fill in folks' gaps, do the necessary remediation so that this year's damage doesn't last? Okay. You know, that's what we work on a lot here at Khan Academy, but I'll, I'll be very open. You know, it's, when I think about interfacing at kind of a governmental level, especially the federal government, it feels very intimidating. How do you get these two worlds to kind of work together? Do you think there are opportunities there? I sure do. You know, there are there are platforms like uh, AmeriCorps and City Year and, and programs like that that could be built out to engage a, a workforce, if you will, that could be engaged in this tutoring and coaching. You know, we know here's the problem kids have, have lost ground. And second, we know we need to intervene with them in safe ways. Well, how do we do that? Well, it's going to be one-on-one -on -one engagement, often online, sometimes in person, can be in person. We could do that safely, potentially. How do we get them trained and with research-based practices? How do we identify the kids that need help the most? And how do we use platforms like AmeriCorps and others to, you know, set sail and, and join hands on this, on this uh, issue? You know, I think people, whether they're retired people or university students, people want to help our students catch up. And so you're kind of imagining a world where AmeriCorps or maybe even a broader kind of coalition of volunteers are actually going in there and providing the the one-on-one -on -one help uh, that a lot of kids are going to arguably always needed, but need even more now. I exactly. And I, and I think we have existing platforms of both at the state and federal level that can be deployed to do that. We can pay some of these people. Maybe there are some that are volunteers. What we know for sure is that these individuals will need skills and training uh, at a sophisticated level uh, to help kids get caught up. Obviously, you know, it's easier to do in, in, with younger children than if you're trying to help kids get caught up in calculus. You have to know something about calculus, like you saw. <laughs> No, no, I, 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 absolutely. You know, it's interesting because obviously Khan Academy is one layer where people can get practice at their own time and pace and fill in those gaps. Uh, and, you know, one idea that your your last comment just kind of triggered in my mind is maybe working with a lot of these groups so that they can be kind of a, a force that engages a lot of these students on platforms like Khan Academy, but also the opportunity to do small group or one-on-one -on -one tutoring. There's a separate not-for-profit that we've just spawned up, that, that I've just spawned up. It's separate from Khan Academy called schoolhouse.world, which is focused on how do we pair students for free uh, with live tutoring. Uh, so I, I'd Perfect. love to talk to you off offline about how all of these different pieces uh, can, can fit together. On the digital divide, which was kind of your second big point, which I couldn't agree with more, what do you think, well, well first question, why don't you think this was part of, you know, maybe the first few rounds of stimulus? It feels like a, a no brainer to me, you know, for 10 or $20 billion out of a trillion or two, you could maybe solve this problem. Um, and do you think this is, you have hopes that it will happen in the next few rounds of stimulus? You know, it's, it's a complicated problem. Every state is different. The provider community, the private sector community is different in, in each state. Uh, whether they have attacked this through some sort of a central planning process or a hub. 
uh, that varies all over the country. So I know that we in Texas are one of just six states that don't have a plan, which limits our ability to draw down federal resources. Mm -hmm. But when I ask why is that, uh, it's because we're big, we have a multitude of providers, we have, you know, the not the bottom of the Grand Canyon, but the Rio Grande Valley, I mean, very, very remote places. And then, of course, what we know for sure, and you know this, uh, is that in urban America, this is an affordability issue. Uh, it's not that the infrastructure doesn't exist. It's that folks uh, can't afford the hundreds of dollars often it is for those high-speed connections. And, and how would you recommend we, we can solve this? Is this something that does get solved at the federal government level? You put in a stimulus program or something else, or is, it, is this more of a state level issue? I think it's going to have to be a combination of both. I mean, some federal policies, some, some freeing up of op options for states, but states are fundamentally going to have to attack it. You know, obviously we need additional resources from the federal government. We, we in the states cannot print money for these sorts of things like they can. But if we're gonna address it quickly, uh, it'll need to be a partnership. And and as we go through this crisis, obviously a lot of suboptimal things. You know, we've talked about several of them. A lot of kids might fall further behind. They've been disengaged. Do you see any potential silver linings from what we're going through right now, or or reasons for hope? Yeah, you know, I I used that same phrase, and Arnie Duncan corrected me the other day and said these are not silver linings; they're hard lessons. And and I and I agree with mm -hmm. that. But but I do think there are some some takeaways uh, that that uh, and some learnings from this. One is uh, I think parents are have a better understanding of where their students are. Uh, you know, it's one thing to get a a report card home in the backpack, and it's a whole other thing to see your child working and struggling and maybe not reading on grade level or uh, with the you know needed math skills or whatever. So I think parents have some insights they didn't before. Uh, secondly, I think you know we've made a much more progress in technology uh, learning and, and having our teachers, yes, struggle with it, but make progress and understand how we could better maximize this tool. Uh, third, I think we're, we're learning and seeing that it can be a tool where customization and embedded assessment and mo progress monitoring can be, you know, standard uh, operating procedure. Uh, so I think there are some things, we are also learning that our human capital can be in, deployed in more efficient and smarter ways. Uh, maybe we need to have the world's best lecturer uh, doing the teaching uh, remotely while you know, others are doing coaching and one-on-one -on -one meetings with parents and families and students and the like. So I, I think we are learning some things. We're seeing a proliferation of innovation and problem solving around the country. And one thing I do think is missing that I wish we would, would do is engage our universities to go uh, establish a research agenda so that at the end of the day, at the end of this big experiment, we've learned some things about what worked and what didn't. No, I love that last idea because, yeah, there's always, you know, universities are always looking for things to research and we have a massive experiment going on right now. <laughs> yes, we do. That yes, seems, we do. That seems worth, worth study. So we're getting a lot of questions in from a social media from YouTube. Park Pal is asking, what's it like being Secretary of Education? What do Secretaries of Education do? Uh, and, yeah, that's, a, I mean, I'll just add to that question. That's a question, yeah. We, yeah, we imagine, you know, in other countries, we would call it a minister of education. How, mm -hmm. What is the role? How is it special in the United States, especially? Well, you know, I, I, it's an important platform. And I think, uh, and, and, you know, I'll leave to the audience uh, how well it's been maximized in this recent past. But, you know, if I were the secretary of education, I would be gathering experts uh, from all of these fields, mental health, uh, technology disease uh, control, space utilization. I never called anybody from the White House or from the U.S. Department of Education and say, I need your help where they didn't come a running. And so I mm -hmm. think it can be a convener of expertise, a proliferator of information and practice. Uh, it can be a great listening agency as and department as people are struggling with and learning from uh, what happens. So to use that bully pulpit in really muscular ways is, is a big part of the job. Uh, secondly, it can be an advocate uh, for resources, both within the administration and in the Congress, and uh, a translator of what's happening uh, around the country and, and a solution provider 
uh, so that the Congress can um, can act. And you know, I, I I think we could do a better job of doing that too, especially on things like broadband. You know, what are the consequences for not having broadband in our schools, both in terms of learning loss, but in terms of of healthcare and and a lack of economic connectedness and the like. So it's basically an information uh, proliferator, a listener, and a gatherer of expertise on the policy level. And then secondly, and importantly, especially in higher education, certainly in K-12 too, it is a uh, distributor of needed resources, especially around issues of equity, Title I schools, uh, financially uh, needy students in higher education and the like. On that last, on that kind of policy budgetary front, where do you see the biggest levers? You know, if you were if you were advising the next president, where would you try to make sure you see extra investment? Well, I think you know one of the things, of course, you would expect me to say this as a as a, a strong advocate for assessment and measurement and transparency uh, that No Child Left Behind uh, started and that was affirmed by the uh, Every Student Succeeds Act. And that is that we have to, you know, we will not solve issues of equity if we bury our heads in the sand and stop caring enough to find out, as I like to say. So how do we think about uh, measurement and accountability and, and testing in this era? What's appropriate? How do we do it? How do we collect data? How do we uh, still have that accountability? You know, we taxpayers are paying a, a big load uh, for educating our students. And yes, these are, are challenging times, but but how might we think about those issues going forward? I'm a big what gets measured gets done kind of person. And I, I think that's a major issue before policymakers and educators now. And how do we thread that needle? Because it makes a ton of sense. You know, anytime someone says, you know, it's very popular to beat up standardized assessment. And I always say, would you right. prefer non-standardized assessment? <laughs> would you prefer no <laughs> assessment? Uh, because, uh, you know, it seems you like ask. you need it. <laughs> right. But, but it, 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 yeah, maybe some people would agree with that, but, you know, yeah. but it does seem like it's an interesting question of how it is used or how it is, is perceived. I, you know, there's a lot of debate right now at the college admissions level around schools going testing optional and maybe out of necessity because of COVID, but some, you know, the uh, university of California system just like, you know, literally said, we will not consider ACTs or SATs. How do you think this is going to evolve and, and where do you think it should evolve to? Well, wh what we know is that no system is perfect. And as you say, you know, a lot of higher ed institutions are test optional. Well, it, it, in my view, it's just a matter of time uh, before things that are less standardized, less validated, uh, more subjective come into question about fairness, discrimination, uh, and whatnot. So. Uh, I like to think that, you know, what we need is a full, full and complete picture uh, of which standardized measurement is a part. And certainly that's, that's true in K-12 education as well. Where I think we are getting, and this is what technology will bring us, is embedded progress monitoring uh, along the way that gives teachers real-time information so that they can tailor their, their instruction they can intervene uh, with students, you know, along the way. One of the things that was a, a I guess, a flaw, although you know the industry was where it where it was, uh, you know, back in those days, you know, that the, the teachers didn't see the value in assessment because it took too long to get any information to them that was useful. And so I think technology will help us solve those gaps, course correct, and it'll be better for kids. It'll be better for teachers. And I hope that, you know, the, this high stakes notion will, will die down. You know, it's real high stakes for students to lose as much educational ground as they're losing now. And explain the term progress monitoring a little bit more. It's a, it's a term for those of, you know, who are in education. It's a, it's a term that's very fashionable these days. What does it mean to you? It means that you're checking in on students in a regular way and mm -hmm. course correcting along the way. So just like you, when, when, you know, when I was in school back in the dark ages, you know, you had your weekly spelling check or your weekly pop quiz or your, you know, so it's, it's a regular assessment, uh, low stakes, embedded, often online that gives teachers and students information about where they are. Yeah, the, the way we imagine it is 
as you mentioned, it could be on a paper base. It doesn't need technology, but you know, like so on something like Khan Academy, every interaction is not just practice. It's also an assessment. You can log it and we give exactly. the reports to teachers. And if they can look at that in real time, they can make the appropriate interventions and, and uh, do that type of thing. And to your point in that type of a world, you don't have to have that, you know, you got one shot at this student and it, it, you right. know, this is going to be your grade for the term, depending on how you do. If you haven't done so well, the first go, keep working on it and not a big exactly. deal. Exactly. Exactly. That's the other thing that I think is going to be a silver lining out of this is, you know, we are learning and we already knew this, but, you know, we'll, we'll come to expect that, you know, education is more a la carte, that some students mm -hmm. are going to master something in three months, some it will take 13 months, but that, that this customization because of the embedded progress monitoring and because the use of technology coupled with great educators will really uh, change this model, I hope. So, you know, we talked a lot about a 2036 from a Texas lens, but I'll, I'll stay indexed on that year since that's a, a lot of focus of your life. How yeah. do you think, especially the education world, it, you know, we, we talked a little bit about how Texas might be different in 2036, but how, how do you think education needs to be different or how do you think it will be different if we go fast forward 15 or 16 years? You know, I think we have to start thinking more seriously about how we use time uh, at, at, it, different from now, you know, the academic year has been blown up. The academic calendar has been blown up. And so how do we uh, use our time in ways that are uh, more a la carte, my word, uh, and, and we have things like stackable credentials and badging and proof of mastery along a continuum uh, and you just put that in your, in your portfolio or your backpack or whatever. Uh, so that you're evidencing your learning along the way. I think one thing that I'm seeing, and, and this is certainly happening in higher education and certainly in the employer community, you know, brand is starting to matter much less. You know, the name mm -hmm. of the institution on the top of your diploma matters less now than, you know, can you code? Can you think critically? Can you write? Can you, you know, this, that, and the other thing? And I think we in education and in organizations like yours, Sal, are going to have to help translate, does this person have a skill? Does this person have this knowledge? No, you're absolutely, I mean, I, I, I also share that dream uh, that, you know, in the next five, 10, 15 years, uh, pathways are not based on seat time. There's alternative pathways. They're based on competency. Um, and you can kind of clue together your own experience and they can, they can directly um, have have pathways to whatever folks want. You know, just in, in the remaining time we have, we have a lot of educators watching this. We have a lot of parents. We have a lot of students. Any, you know, kind of thoughts uh, that you, any advice you'd have for them? One is they're trying to na navigate their, their own or their children's education through COVID and then think about the future broadly. Well, I do think there's there's no harm, whether you're a policymaker in a state legislature or a, or a mom or dad with a student or, or a teacher, understanding, you know, how are we aligning our performance with our use of resources? And what I like to say is we got to put our money where our mouths are. You know, we say it's important to, to close the achievement gap and to make sure that all students reach a particular level. That was the whole, you know, genius, if you will, behind No Child Left Behind and having those higher expectations for all of our students. But we also have to resource uh, that issue like, like we were, uh, were real. And so we need to be looking at, well, how do we deploy technology? How do we deploy teachers? I mean, are our very best teachers working in our most challenging settings? Do we have the right curriculum, technology supports, interventions to close the achievement gap? So how do we think about resources coupled with uh, goals and objectives for students and families? And if you haven't, uh, go find out how your school is doing. Obviously, those will be old data points from, from last school year. But uh, you know this school year, we ought to be looking at not necessarily accountability based on a test, but where are the kids? Uh, you know, how many minutes are, are they learning uh, a day? You know, what are the outcomes? We have to keep our eye on the ball and care enough to find out, uh, as I like to say, as opposed to kind of this ostrich approach of burying our heads in the sand and hoping for the best. Yeah. Yeah, no, don't, don't be afraid of the information. Don't be afraid of the messenger, exactly. so to speak. Exactly. No, well, well, 
thank you so much, uh, Margaret. This was, you know, uh, I, I guess I really enjoyed this because a lot of a lot of what you said <laughs> resonates very, very strongly, well. very, very strongly with me. Uh, but you know, it, it's it's always great, especially in times of crisis like this, to kind of you know think about how how we could be doing things and how we can come out of this in a in, in a better uh, in better shape than than we maybe we even entered it. So thank you Not, so much. Don't waste the crisis, as they say. Don't waste the crisis. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for joining Thanks. us. Thanks, Al. Appreciate you. So thanks, everyone, for, for joining today, uh, as always, or not always, but as, especially today. Uh, thank you. Uh, it was a great conversation with Secretary Spellings. Uh, it's always great to talk to national leaders who, um, you know, I think are really thinking about the future in a way that's going to uh, best serve students and uh, best serve uh, teachers and, and parents. And um, I, I uh, thanks for joining. And, you know, we got to stay tuned. I'm, I'm also keeping track of what's going on in the election. That's the other interesting thing going on in everyone's lives right now. Uh, but we will see you next week. So please join us for the next uh, Homeroom with Sal live stream then.